My, my presentation, according to what we planned uh, to do, is a kind of review of uh, classical and uh, um, quantum aspects uh, of, uh, let's say, hydrodynamics. I apologize immediately to people who have, uh, um, of course, strong interest in physics, because my talk will be on the mathematics uh, behind the physics. Of course, the physics is, for me, far more important than the mathematics, but I can only contribute with something in terms of mathematics. So you will have a kind of review of uh, key aspects uh, for me uh, that are important in the mathematical physics uh, approach to classical vortex dynamics and quantum fluids. I have to say that I'm not that young, and so I take today a kind of little celebration for my uh, first influential, so to speak, paper in classical vortex dynamics that was published in JFM 30 years ago. <laughs> so many uh, of you are so young, they were not born then, but uh, that uh, is a kind of a nice coincidence. Okay, let's uh, see what I plan to do. The first slide, uh, I apologize because it's a kind of a very, very, one slide only, very short summary of what uh, uh, we know about uh, uh, Bose-Einstein condensates. So it's a little bit of a, uh, how to say, a, 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 crash, uh, a crash presentation on historical aspects. So I apologize because I will mention, of course, contributions from physicists. And uh, as I said, I'm not, a physicist. But anyway, uh, we will move to Grosby-Tajewski equation quickly, and then uh, a comparison with the uh, Navier-Stokes hydrodynamics in classical vortex dynamics. Then we will see aspects of the dynamics of vortex filament and uh, quantum defects. Uh, then uh, uh, some, uh, some considerations on a crucial phenomena for development of turbulence, i.e. Reconnection, and as uh, as you can read immediately, I pointed out anti-parallel reconnection, and uh, I will uh, I will tell you what I mean by that. And then we have uh, information on helicity and the topological interpretation of helicity that is rooted in my PhD work with uh, Keith Moffat in Cambridge. And then uh, the condition of zero helicity in particular and the effects uh, that these conditions have uh, on uh, the topological cascade and eventually the production of new defects. So this is the plan of my talk. And uh, let's have a look uh, very quickly, as I said, uh, of um, a little bit of history, just to put uh, things in context. So here I, uh, mention uh, the paper by Griffin, he's a physicist, uh, and is a very, very good paper. Alan Griffin gives you in this paper of 2009 um, a kind of a review uh, of uh, the developments. And the developments uh, start, of course, uh, from uh, a manuscript uh, sent uh, uh, to Einstein by Bose. And uh, it is interesting something I learned uh, just recently, that uh, the manuscript uh, um, pushed Einstein to adopt first, before any other, um, the wave, uh, wave uh, function idea of De Broglie. So it's not true, according to Griffin, that uh, it was after Schrodinger that Einstein considered that. Actually, it was before. Schrodinger, and he wanted to apply the so-called uh, wave interpretation of De Broglie because he was uh, working or paying attention to photons. So because uh, photons uh, were thought to be particles like uh, uh, bosons, like uh, photons or bosons being a, a, a general class of photons, then he wanted to use a wave function uh, approach to that. That is quite interesting. Okay, so we have uh, the following. We have um, the, uh, probably I touched something that I need to get out. Okay, thank you. And uh, so the first uh, uh, mention has to do with superfluidity. 
and the discovery of superfluidity. I remember visiting Moscow. I was in the visited the house of uh, Kapitsa that became a, a museum as well. As you know, sh surely Kapitsa was a leading figure and a great research on superfluidity in Cambridge. And then when he moved back to Moscow, he wanted all the apparatus sent uh, to Moscow. But uh, the work started with London. So we have here exactly what we learn on books, uh, a kind of uh, uh, continues uh, uh, go forth and backward in wave interpretation and particle interpretation. So the matter wave uh, interpretation uh, started already at those uh, during those years, and we have uh, the idea of a micros microscopic wave function from London. And afterwards, in the 35 and 36 and 38, he discovered uh, the work of Einstein, and so he started to consider Beck's, uh, what we call now Beck's uh, uh, then. Then after uh, the period of London, we have uh, the two fluid theory developed by Landau. So we go back to quasi-particles. So you see, we start from wave function approach, and then Landau proposed this uh, particle approach, the matter approach on particles uh, and conservation laws, uh, and uh, disputed uh, the wave uh, approach of others. And then, of course, I mentioned just the key names here, because there are many, many people, uh, Tietz and many, so many others. And then we go back to wave functions with uh, Feynman. So this is uh, the interplay of matter and wave that we all know. Uh, then, uh, as uh, you all know, uh, the, we have the, um, the work of gross pitayevsky and the microscopic wave function approach from the mean field theory. So I will, uh, I will focus on this uh, now well-known gross pitayevsky equation, remembering that uh, the mean field theory before a microscopic wave function was actually the great, uh, the great contribution of Gross and Pitayevsky. They published the papers in the same year, 61. And from 61, we had the uh, search for uh, this uh, new um, state of matter uh, for many years uh, till now. So let's say till 90, 1990s, uh, we have a period of great work. Finally, we have the realization of condensates. You all know the success, the Nobel Prize is given to a number of people and uh, the visualization is uh, representing here the presence of two defects. And this is more or less the year of uh, the paper by Cornell Wieman and then Ketterle got the Nobel Prize. Um, from uh, more or less uh, the 80s, uh, 10, 15 years earlier, Remember, what we had is a great development of uh, direct numerical simulations of Navier-Stokes equation. So during a period where the, say, study and laboratory search for condensate developed, we have a period where great success of direct numerical simulations of Navier-Stokes. That means uh, that uh, the codes, the numerical codes for Navier-Stokes equation were refined and refined and refined. And at a certain point, when we get to this stage, we have the benefit of two contributions. One contribution comes from uh, the hydrodynamic description of gross pitayevsky In other words, the work at the time of Einstein, I remember Einstein was skeptical about uh, uh, the Copenhagen group, and he was joined by two great people. One was Bob, and the other one was Madelung, 1927. And it is with Madelung, 1927, that we started to have a hydrodynamic uh, approach to what we may call gross pitayevsky equation now. So a kind of deterministic approach. So you see, when we get to this stage, we have the benefit of the work done then that for many, many years uh, was kind of uh, left aside, the Madelung approach. And then the benefit of the computational tools that were developed for classical fluid mechanics. And the two uh, rivers joined into a, a bigger river that we are now in, and this is uh, uh, producing um, uh, something like this. 
uh, there are many, many simulations of uh, quantum fluid turbulence, and the quantum fluid turbulence relies on the progress done on direct numerical simulations of classical fluids. So this interplay uh, once more tell us how important is uh, science and interconnection in science. And uh, more than this, in uh, recent years, people started to look at the uh, even the complexity of these structures, even the topological complexity of these structures. So I'm pleased to show you uh, work done by the Berengis group, uh, Cooper and Tal, uh, 2019, and then followed other works uh, where uh, they search for knots, for a, a filament forming knots in this uh, tangle of a superfluid uh, filaments and trying to classify knot type complexity. And this gives you an idea of uh, where we stand now. Okay, so I said that my approach will be on the uh, mathematical background of all this. And uh, so I start with this equation. I typically from mathematics, we like to consider the non-dimensional equation. So sorry, physicists, you won't see a mass here mentioned or anything like this. It's just been non-dimensionalized. And uh, psi, of course, is the wave function, function of uh, the uh, vector position x and time t. And uh, for simplicity, we take uh, uh, this uh, uh, domain uh, uh, infinitely extended and we take uh, the mod psi squared going to one as we go to uh, say infinity, so to speak. All right, so this is the start point. And then I mentioned Madelung 1927. We have this uh, transformation that is uh, remarkable and uh, it couples uh, basically the uh, psi function with the uh, Theta, theta has different names, uh, is, uh, um, if you like, uh, um, the phase uh, uh, function of the wave function, uh, sometimes is called the, um, you know, it has different names. I'll, uh, I'll use the letter theta, very often is, uh, uh, the symbol is a capital S, but theta, you will see why I use theta very easy. Um, just, uh, it reminds us of an angle, right? And indeed, I will refer to this angle as the angle, azimuthal angle for isophase surfaces. And rho is just, uh, let's say, the density. So from this transformation, we are led to consider this uh, ultra uh, uh, low temperature gas of bosons as if it were a fluid, a kind of virtual fluid. Because remember, it's a gas of particles. But uh, uh, at those uh, low density and low pressure, we can take uh, this, uh, um, this uh, transformation, we plug it in the gross pitayevsky equation, and you see we have a real and imaginary part. So the real and imaginary part in the gross pitayevsky equation produce two equations. And uh, okay, these are the equation. I mentioned the book by Barangi and Parker is very accessible to students. And of course, is biased, so to speak, towards the hydrodynamic approach. There is a well, well known book. If you want to start from real physics, is the uh, Stringari and Pichayevsky book, is uh, highly technical and uh, very hard to read for people like me. So uh, I suggest to have a look at this book. In this book, you have uh, just the derivation of what is well known. From gross pitayevsky you go to this uh, two equation by separating the imaginary and real part. You get the continuity equation, and this is just the uh, Euler fluid. And then we have this equation here. Uh, uh, du dt represent the acceleration times, uh, so to speak, the mass density. And uh, so you have uh, Newton's law. And this is just the conservation of linear momentum. And uh, the conservation of linear momentum resembles very much the Navier-Stokes equation. And the Navier-Stokes equation are given here. And uh, you see, we have uh, exactly the same continuity equation. And uh, if we compare 
the equation for from gross Pitayevsky to the standard classical fluid, we can think of this term as a kind of a pressure term. And then we have the tensor, the tensor contribution. And of course, this is different. When we focus on the structure of these uh, tensors, uh, we discover, you see, we have, uh, first of all, to explicit this tensor in this form. Okay, we have that one. What about this one? Well, we do a little uh, mathematics on this, and this is well-known structure of the Navier-Stokes equation, where we have uh, these uh, two coefficients. We can reduce the coefficients to one if we assume incompressibility. And in the case uh, of incompressibility, we just compare the two. We can see that uh, here, notice, everything depends on rho. So differences in density induce a different force, a difference in a, a different inertia, a different movement. But here we have a contribution from pressure and velocity. Okay, so this can be thought of as a function of rho, indeed is a function of rho, and nothing else. This is one key difference between the two states. There are other two important differences, or many other important differences I will point out. But the first thing to remember is that, yes, you can regard this as a kind of Navier-Stokes equation, but you have control on the dynamics given by differences in the particle distribution. So I encourage you to think, well, this is biased from mathematics, to think that different mass distribution uh, is like uh, valleys and peaks of mass. And so if you have, uh, uh, you know, just peaks of mass, you have a flow that goes from high peaks to down uh, to valleys, and that gives you an idea of the dynamics. Dynamics entirely controlled by a gradients of a density in particular. All right, so what we have now? Well, vortex filaments in classical mechanics are crucial. This world was known since the time of Leonardo da Vinci, well known. Uh, problem is that to tackle vortices, in particular, the curl of the velocity, different from zero, was a big problem from a mathematical viewpoint. And we have to wait until Helmholtz. Helmholtz paper addresses in the first page, 1858, he addresses two problems that uh, were facing mathematicians at the time, and physicists, of course. First problem, the uh, presence of vorticity. Curl of u different from zero at, let's say, a point. Oh, that was horrendous at a point. It meant uh, velocity going to infinity on that point. So it was a big, big challenge. Many mathematicians didn't want to deal with that because it implied lots of strange uh, thinking. And the other problem, also crucial, was to tackle the effect of uh, viscosity, dissipation. And that was done by Stokes. So in the first page of Helmholtz's paper, you have these two major problems, and he will clearly say, he will clearly state, uh, I leave uh, dissipation to others, and I will work on the curl of u different from zero. So from that paper, we have uh, the conservation laws of classical vortex dynamics. Okay, so you see, you have a vorticity that may look as a concentrated uh, a tube, like a cyclone. I remind the younger ones uh, that uh, you do not see vorticity. Vorticity is a mathematical concept. You see powder, you see some, some, uh, some uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, way to visualize vorticity, but you do not see vorticity itself is a, is a mathematical vector field. Anyway, this is a concentrated vorticity. You may have vorticity that concentrates in filaments, in tubes, and then you separate, and this is again a kind of mathematical simplicity, you separate the region here from the region there. And you say, okay, the region here is irritational, and the region there is a strongly rotational. And this is a simplification because, because of dissipation, you have vorticity kind of everywhere. But of course, it decays rapidly away. 
So what we have is uh, this picture, the actual uh, distribution of uh, velocity, the azimutal velocity, the velocity of the fluid that's circulating around the vortex uh, as uh, this profile. And this profile is in the inner region of the vortex core. The, um, the increase of rotation is almost linear. And then it reaches a point more or less on the boundary. And then uh, from the boundary upwards, you assume irrotationality and irrotational flow decays like this. And so you have a composition of rotational inside and irrotational given by this, uh, this uh, black dashed curve. All right. Then uh, what we have uh, is uh, the discovery of defects in condensate. As far as I know, uh, a single defect has not been visualized. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, the only pictures we have is a cloud, a cloud of uh, uh, particles. And within this cloud, we have these dots, and these dots represent defects. So you may induce somehow the rotation, and then the rotation, if you like, circulation, will uh, uh, decay in multiple, in the presence of multiple defects of what we call charge or circulation equal to one. So we have this information here. However, defects, now people try to uh, produce defects, for example, as a vortex ring or other configurations. This is work going on right now. And what we have uh, is uh, this idea. The idea is that we have a, a kind of singularity. It's a kind of singularity. There is, there is a, the defect is here, and then the velocity is one over r. So you see, one over r. So it means uh, irrotational irrotational fluid away from the defect, except where there is a defect. And this is a kind of a little challenge for mathematicians. So I like to, to uh, tackle these aspects because it's a kind of contradiction. Where is vorticity here? There is no vorticity anywhere except on a line. What does it mean that? And then outside it decays irrotationally. So is, this is one of the differences, okay? One difference is that here we have a, a finite cross-section, finite vortex core, and here we do not have any vortex core. The velocity goes uh, one over r everywhere, and here there is a region that can be rotational, and other region then is irrotational. Okay, so what we have? We have a uh, motion of uh, these uh, uh, filaments and motion of these defects. In order to understand the dynamics, I give you here one slide of a crash course in uh, basics of vortex dynamics. Question? Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yes. One dot. Okay. Yeah, is a defect. Is a defect in the in the visualization. Diffusion. Distribution, sure, sure. I will use, I, I don't know what you mean by that, but I will use technically that word. Sure, I, you will see, you will see that indeed, I will use the distributional approach, correct, okay. Right, so let's start from the beginning for classical uh, mathematical physics. So we have, uh, consider, well, this is just 
uh, undergraduate uh, information, consider we have a point and the neighboring point, X and Y uh, just uh, are two different points in space, very close one another, very close. And so if you go to this point and you tailor expand the velocity, you have these uh, three contributions. This is standard from Lagrange. And we have a contribution due just to translation. If you like rigid translation, we have a contribution uh, due to uh, the word, uh, it depends on textbooks, but deformation of the volume. And here we have a contribution due to rotation, right? Okay, now what we do is uh, typically we take uh, the limit as epsilon going to X. So we're going to the point and uh, we assume for simplicity here, we assume to take uh, the uh, rigid translation equal to zero. We are moving with the fluid and uh, deformation of the volume equal to zero for simplicity. Of course, we have contributions from uh, UT and UD. If you do all this, you work out UR and uh, you discover the well-known Biot-Savart law for electromagnetic uh, field. In this context, it's just vortex dynamics. Crucial law because it tells you uh, many things. It tells you, first of all, remember where you have X star, read or think vorticity. There is vorticity. So vorticity, I denote vorticity with omega, the curl of u. And then uh, this is uh, the equation. X minus X star means uh, I'm away from the, uh, from the source point, from the X star. And as I move close to uh, X star from X, uh, I have the induced velocity given here. So the induced velocity is given by the integral of vorticity over the volume of vorticity. So this is a global functional of vorticity. But now we are kind of assuming that we don't deal with vorticity spread everywhere. We assume that we deal with vortex filament tubes. So vorticity is concentrated in a tube. And what we have is uh, an asymptotic uh, theory. And this is uh, already mentioned in a bachelor book. So you can go to chapter seven and have a look at this uh, theory. And uh, uh, we take a, a fixed core size for the tube, for the vortex tube. Then we take a very large aspect ratio given by the local radius of curvature of the filament with respect to the core size. And then we take uniform vorticity distribution across, across the cross section. These are simplifying hypotheses, of course, that gives you a law that you can easily use in computations, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, it's a, although it's an asymptotic theory, it still can be improved. That's clear because you can assume that vorticity is not at all uniform. For example, is a Gaussian profile, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you do all this, you reduce uh, uh, the integral uh, is a volume integral. You reduce it to a line integral. So the volume becomes essentially uh, given by the axis of this uh, vortex uh, tube. And then you average out from the volume, the circulation, the rotation, the contribution over the cross section. So you reduce Biot-Savart to a line integral. Still some progress, but still terrible. It's terrible because as you approach x to x star, you have typically a singularity in the velocity. So the usual problem I mentioned uh, tackled by, by Helmholtz uh, is still there in front of us. So we have to deal with that. And one way to deal with that is that we can go as close as possible to some border of the vortex tube, and then we stop there. And indeed is what is done technically, numerically, etc. So uh, the next step is uh, working out an asymptotic theory on uh, the line integral, and this is the result. Uh, I mean, is the first first step result. You can see now, you can read how is the velocity. The velocity is given by this uh, contribution, azimutal contribution that is decaying with sigma, one over sigma or one over r. And then uh, the other contribution in terms uh, of a Frenet frame put on the filament. 
normal by normal tangent. You have a tube on, uh, on L, and this B says that uh, the tube locally moves along the binormal contribution, plus finite terms. Why I do this, why I present this in this fashion? Because remember, if sigma, the cross-section, goes to zero, you have a singularity here, one over R, the distance from the center line, and here you have a singularity as well, two singularities. Right. If sigma is uh, your vortex uh, core radius, then uh, you stop it there, and that is uh, what you get. Now, this uh, was known, actually I mentioned Bachelor, and I was the one to tell Bachelor that this uh, work was done much earlier than what he did in the 60s. He was uh, shocked by that news. Uh, and it was done by a student of Levi Civita in Italy. And uh, the work uh, was done by Darius, 1905, which is amazing. Uh, you know, I give you, I'm happy to tell you the reaction of Bachelor. You know, somebody might have said, oh, oh, really? Don't say anything to anybody. But he was a great, great scientist. And he said, really, if all you said is true, I will help you to have it published uh, in the best possible journal. And I was lucky to have a paper in Nature when I was a, a kind of 30s, maybe 28 or something like that. But it appeared uh, in 91. OK, so what uh, Darius did, he said, OK, I do not uh, consider this contribution, I do not consider this, I consider L some length along the line over sigma, basically in time a constant, because a sigma is so small and L is the length, I consider it almost as a constant, so gamma is a constant because we are in ideal fluid mechanics, so circulation constant, four pi constant, this constant is one over R, one over R along the binormal, we have the so-called localized induction approximation. This equation was used a lot in superfluid community. I remember a paper by Schwartz uh, studying tur superfluid turbulence using LIA. It works. It works, especially if you are a very highly tangled uh, vortex structure. But is a crude approximation of this, and this is a crude approximation of this, and this is an approximation of the whole bio savoir. So you see how it works. Right, so this is as far as we have in vortex dynamics so far. Of course, we have dissipation, the distribution of vorticity that is not uh, uh, constant on the cross section. The cross section itself is not uh, circular, is uh, of course changing in time, so many complexities that can be arranged on this uh, from, uh, from the BIOS of our equation and so on and so forth. What about defects? Now I told you um, I have a kind of mathematical approach to this problem. So uh, remember by definition from the wave uh, function theory, a defect is a nodal line of the wave function. A nodal line means uh, no thickness. There is no tube, nothing. It's a line, it's a geometric uh, line. And I define this line as psi equals zero, exactly. So it's one line in space. Okay, L can be thought of as the intersection of the isophase surfaces. So imagine that you have a straight line for simplicity, and imagine that you now consider the isophase uh, due to the wave function, and this isophase, if you have a defect, the isophase, uh, 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 the defect can be thought of as an intersection of this isophase. So you foliate the whole space with the isophase surfaces. If you have a defect, these isophase surfaces are intersecting there. Okay, so if uh, are in this consideration, the ambient space is foliated by infinitely many isophase surfaces. And what uh, we have is from Madelung, we plug Madelung there. We remember the velocity is defined as the grad of theta. So we have circulation, we can measure cir circulation. And because we integrate over a closed line around the defect, uh, this circulation results quantized. Okay, so other information, Classical fluids, circulation is a real number, 
defects and those Einstein condensate or superfluid, circulation is quantized. All right. Then from various works, we have Padet approximation for density. Density here, this is the distance from the defect. Density is exactly zero. So we go back to our Madelung and we have the defect where there is no mass or no particles or no density. So the nodal line, the mathematical nodal line, corresponds to a kind of hole in, this, in space. And indeed, the black holes that we were seeing before were those holes, where the region where light uh, where was not em emitted, and so we we could see these uh, dark spots. Okay, so remember, this is the statement. On the defect, rho is exactly zero. Right, so what we have is uh, our condensate, and we think of a hole for the defect. Oh, it's much thinner than this much thinner than this, is infinitesimally thin. So we can think of something like this. And uh, so we have uh, the velocity from uh, vorticity on a line. Remember, we have this, this problem in mathematics, uh, vorticity on a line in relation to velocity. But when we measure velocity, we have a velocity that goes one over r. And the work of uh, Bustamante and Nazarenko based uh, on gross pitayevsky equation allowed them to derive basically the same equation as we have for classical fluid. The same equation from Biosavar, they were able to derive Biosavar from gross pitayevsky of course making assumptions. So this is the stage where we are. So summing up, you have a dynamics dictated by vortex filament and dynamics di dictated by gross pitayevsky that are almost the same. So the effects of dynamics are also the same. Remember this, the effects we'll expect are uh, probably the same, and we'll see that. All right, so I am not satisfied of what I told you. First problem, Vorticity in terms of curl of u, but u is a grad of, uh, of theta by Madelung, so that means vorticity is zero. How on earth you can have a circulation, yes, but vorticity on a point. And the second thing is this, that uh, circulation, every book says uh, from experiments, that circulation is quantized. I, I was not happy. I wanted to derive quantization of circulation. So this goes like this. I will give you the answers to these two problems. Uh, first of all, I'm talking about now the, the first issue here. First of all, remember where we started. The ambient space has a hole. And if it has a hole, it's multiply connected. And so from potential theory, exactly as I did for vortex, classical vortex dynamics, starting from potential theory, I will use potential theory here too, but I will use multi-valued potential theory. And uh, okay, so the, uh, the business is the form, is the following. I start with the idea that uh, vorticity is localized. Okay, so I take it a distributional approach. I take it, okay, this is a Dirac delta function on a line. And then what are the uh, consequences of this? And the consequences are that if uh, this uh, is uh, the definition of vorticity, I have to deal with this integral over the line, and this is the Dirac delta distribution along the tangent to the line. Okay, and then I apply Stokes' theorem. Stokes' theorem tells me about the Dirac distribution in terms of a curl of a Dirac function, but now, considering a surface. What kind of surface? Okay, we resort to Riemann's theory because we have multi-valued uh, potentials. Uh, and so to simplify the connectedness of the ambient space, I insert a cut. This cut is a mathematical cut. It's a virtual cut, it's not a real cut. I call this cut uh, Greek sigma, and then I do my work on this, insert a cut surface, identify this S with the cut surface, and reduce the ambient space to simple connectivity by the cut. The, you know, you do a cut and you open up uh, virtually the space, so it's no longer, uh, uh, the hole is no longer present. Okay, we do that, and uh, uh, this 
is defined in terms of this cut surface. And the cut surface is imagined to have a, a kind of unit delta contribution uh, there, right? All placed on this cut surface. Right. Once uh, you do this, you do a little bit of work, a little bit of computation, not so trivial. And at the end, uh, you come up uh, with the correction to the standard velocity. The standard velocity is, yes, given by this grad theta with the cut in mind, but also due to this uh, distribution of uh, delta Dirac. And so the, the all uh, derivation is uh, presented in a new book that came out uh, this year by Springer and uh, uh, Shin Liu, Professor Liu and I are the editors of this book. And in this chapter, you find the derivation of uh, Bio Savar for the defects. And you see here, Bio Savar is this term. Remember, R hat is a unit vector. If you reduce it to R, the distance X minus X star, this becomes evidently an R cubed here, and you have Bio Savar. Bio Savar plus this correction term. Okay, so this fixes the problem of having the curl of a grad equals zero. The other problem is a circulation quantized. Okay, same approach, because we have a cut surface and we can do the same calculations of in the presence of a cut surface. So this is uh, uh, the business of addressing the issue of quantization of circulation. We, uh, with a cut surface, we reduce theta as in trigonometric function, when you want the functions to be invertible, what you tell students is uh, to consider a subdomain. If you restrict your domain of definition for a trigonometric function, you have a part of the trigonometric function that is invertible. And so you do the same. You have a cut surface. When you do the cut, uh, theta is no longer uh, ambiguous uh, because you go from zero to two pi on the other side of the cut surface. And so you reduce the connectivity. And by reducing the connectivity, you use another theorem. There is a little bit of computation there that uh, I don't uh, cover here. And you arrive at the charge. This is the another charge for uh, gross Pitayeski. And when you use the Noether charge, this is just the, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the difference in position of point uh, due to a little displacement, eta. And when you do this, using the cut, you come up with the right result, 2 pi w. I use w instead of n, uh, because n, uh, yes, is the what uh, often in physical uh, context is called the charge. Uh, I like uh, W, it doesn't matter, but W is the winding number, is the winding number of topological flavor, is the number of times uh, isophase surfaces go around the defect. So you have also a geometric uh, view interpretation of this, uh, of this winding, of this number N. So, okay, this is uh, in a uh, um, student of mine, Andrea Pelloni in the JFM of uh, last year. Okay, uh, right, so you have all this information. Let me move on now to another problem. I remind you what uh, we are now doing. We have uh, the interpretation of Navier-Stokes equation. Then we have the uh, problem of the dynamics of defects, uh, almost due to Biosavar. So if uh, you look at what they do, what the vortex filaments do in classical fluid mechanics, you kind of uh, understand uh, what's going on on defects because the dynamics is similar. Let's have a look at experiments again. And this is a very beautiful work. Uh, it didn't receive so much uh, attention from the press, uh, from the media, but I contributed all the time I can to advertise their work. The work is done by Alexienko's group uh, in Novosibirsk in uh, in uh, almost Siberia. I was invited by them to watch the result of these experiments that are really striking. And uh, now I think Alexienkos and others uh, came up with a book also. So I guess you can read their work in that book. But if you go to the original paper, you can see the English translation of that paper. There is a, a, a link to a movie 
I have the movie, but no time to show it. I suggest especially young people to go and look at the movie. And what you see in the movie, oh, beautiful. Remember the difficulty first to produce a vortex in a laboratory. And secondly, to have a camera focused on the motion of the vortex. Remember the vortex moves with some dynamics. So you have to follow it and keep uh, everything clear as you follow it to zoom in. And then the vortex, you want to induce another vortex and the reconnection between two vortices, even more difficult. And when it happens, you have the camera zooming in with a clear picture. All, the, all these difficulties were addressed by this group. So is uh, now we are thinking, we are in water, water, and uh, we produce, uh, here is barely visible, I know, but uh, here we have uh, uh, one vortex. If you pay attention, this tube uh, goes uh, here, is the red arrow, and then goes behind and comes over. So it's like a, a, a loop that it makes in space. And these two strands, the red and the blue, which denote direction of vorticity, when they get closer and closer, and the movie is striking, is very, very visible. You go straight on the spot of uh, the instant where they approach, and then you see the arrows here are, I'm sorry, I want to go back not to distract you with things. Uh, you see here the arrows are denoting anti-parallel configuration. I'm not saying that this phenomenon is absolutely the same for all vortex interaction. I'm saying that this is generic, is sufficiently present in many, many contexts, anti-parallel reconnection. And you can see in the movie that as they approach, they become anti-parallel. They move one against the other and becoming slowly anti-parallel. When they are very close, they merge together and they separate. And you have uh, here the separation. If you pay attention to the movie or the picture from close distance, you will see there is a slight, just barely visible, a strand of a vorticity survives in this mechanism. Remember, is a vortex, vortex filament in water in real fluid. So we have some vorticity that is uh, kind of dissipated in other, in, uh, in um, uh, structures of smaller scale. Okay, here we have uh, a picture from uh, Zhao and Scalo, uh, and you see the picture is very beautiful work, by the way, is a JFM paper, and uh, in this paper they analyze uh, the change of helicity. We will talk about that in a moment. And you see here the blue tube, anti-parallel with the red tube. And when uh, they are in this region, uh, then in this region, of course, dissipation is important, is dominant there. Forget about Biosavar when you are at that stage. At that stage, you have to consider Stokes equation. You have dissipation here and they separate. And one part of the blue goes with the red, etc., etc. And then the process continues. And what about uh, defects? Well, uh, from classical fluids, we have dissipation of kinetic energy as we know it, and we have entropy, entropy production, 3D case. Hmm? So uh, we have a stretching of the filaments and filamentation and all these processes. What about defects? Well, uh, first, uh, as far as I know, um, um, work on uh, uh, on reconnection of defects uh, in quantum fluids was done by Simone Zucker in the collaboration with Carlo Barenghi and others, and they proved that this is a simulation, is a numerical simulation of Gross Pitayeski. They've shown that when they are, they start with orthogonal configuration, but when they are very, very close and they start to talk to each other, they get anti-parallel, exactly as there, which is a kind of, uh, you know, 2012. And the Bustamante Nazarenko derivation of Biosavar came later. So it is a signature here of the fact that we have something very similar to classical, uh, to classical vortex filaments. And then uh, here in this context, we have production of Kelvin waves and something that is not present here. We have uh, sound emission, emission of acoustic 
waves. So part of the energy goes into uh, kind of waves, mechanical waves along the filament. They depart away from the reconnection stage and part of the energy goes in acoustic emission. Which one is more dominant? Well, in phenomena like this is, uh, has not been, uh, as far as I know, I apologize because I'm just quoting the, the material I know. So as far as I know, there is no clear uh, measurement, quantification, how much goes in one and how much goes in the other. But uh, clearly that is a phenomenon present in all simulations. And when you ask people that are doing uh, quantum turbulence is the wrong, uh, is the wrong, uh, 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 the, the wrong question because it's so hard. You know, quantum turbulence, everything is, uh, is like in a soup and it's very hard to understand how much you have in acoustic, how much you have. But for a single reconnection, yes, you can do it. And I know people uh, during their PhD are trying to figure out that not easy because of so many things, because of the domain, assumption of the domain, if it is infinite, if it is periodic, whatever. So it's not so easy. Anyway, this is the situation. Now, let me move on uh, quickly because I'm late. I'm sorry, I started 9.20 probably. Okay, I'll try to catch up. Helicity, I will be quick on helicity. Helicity is that uh, is the definition. And we know that in ideal fluid mechanics is conserved. Is conserved as kinetic energy. Okay, so it's an important quantity. People are measuring helicity in many, many contexts. Here I have kinetic helicity, u dot omega, but you may have magnetic helicity, a dot b, where a is the vector potential of magnetic uh, field. And we have a topological, sorry for the mistake, topological interpretation of helicity. That is due to Moffat uh, seminal paper of uh, 69, and uh, then a correction coming from uh, uh, our collaboration, helicity, that one, the integral of, can be written in terms of uh, circulations and topological quantities. Uh, LKIJ is the linking number of one structure with the other, Gauss linking number. SLI is a self-linking number given by contributional right and twist. I know that many of you don't know about this, so I have a slide just to remind you of a Gauss linking number. There is a formula. The formula of Gauss linking number, you cannot use it uh, in an efficient way. So I give you a very efficient way to use this formula. You have a link in space. And imagine that you have a link and you project it on a plane. So you do a planar projection of this link. And remember, Gauss linking number is a topological quantity. It doesn't matter which projection you project, because once you compute it, it's invariant under continuous deformation. So you have a link of this type. And then uh, you decide the convention sign from the diagram from a computer, for example, produce diagram. You have two pluses and the rule is extremely simple. You count the pluses according or the minuses according to this convention. There are two pluses, so plus two, and then you divide by two. So linking number of this is one and linking number of that, the mirror image of the same link is uh, minus one. Very simple. So you can implement this in a code that was done by Barenghi. We published a paper on this 2001. 23 years ago, we showed that you can do this on a tangle of filament. You can compute rather sophisticated quantities in that, in that fashion. All right, so the linking number formula is exactly what I mentioned, a half of the sum of the all signed crossings you have on a diagram. So if it is very complicated, you do the sum of all crossings and you divide it by two algebraic sum, plus and minuses, present and you get the linking number information. The self-linking number is also an invariant, is also a topological invariant, a is rather more difficult, uh, is made, this invariant is made by two geometric contributions. And uh, one is the rife, the number of uh, coiling that you have on a filament. In this case, uh, uh, two pluses and one minus, just an example. Uh, this is the uh, just the convention sign. And then uh, uh, you average over all direction of sight. And so if it is rather planar curve, then you get almost the right answer. 
And then you have a twist. Oh, twist, twist is really difficult. Is what we care about because it contains a lot of information about energy. Anyway, so the twist is given by a ribbon placed on the center line that goes around. Where is this ribbon? This is a mathematical concept. So for a defect, we have an easy life. Why? Because defects are the intersection of isophase surfaces. So you go to the isophase surface, theta constant, and then you cut a little ribbon on this surface. And you see how the single theta constant surface uh, goes around the defect. If it doesn't go around, twist is zero. If it goes around, you count the twist. So it's, in a sense, easier to apply it to defect. If this is your defect line and you count uh, how the ribbon goes around on the isophase surface, you have twist. Uh, much, much more difficult is for vortex filament, vortex tubes. Why? Because uh, here is a just color coded of a beautiful paper by Sharon Nordsack that done so many years ago. You see, 1990, this is a nature paper. And you see the vortex lines that are twisting about the center line. But uh, where to, you know, is any line here that you don't see? Is a threshold of lines, et cetera, et cetera, makes uh, stuff complicated. But this is, uh, was already done at that time, so is feasible. Okay, now we have the following three results quickly. Under GPE, we have something new. Under GPE, kinetic helicity is conserved. Okay, so is conserved, it means if it has a value, it stays that value during the evolution. Okay, that is like uh, classical fluid mechanics. But what's the difference? The difference is, is conserved, but its value is zero. And when I mentioned this many years ago at a big conference I organized in Venice, if you remember, uh, they were joking with me and I, I like the joke. I can repeat it. Oh, Renzo, if it is zero, you can claim anything that is zero is conserved by definition. I uh, was puzzled by that fact. And can we prove it? Yes, we can prove it. You go to the paper and there is a proof of that based on Nerva application of Noether theorem again. You find a charge for helicity and you prove that that charge is conserved. And then you do the cut surface calculation and you show that this quantity is zero. I will show you the consequences of zero helicity. Very interesting. Okay, uh, second result is uh, not only that from Noether theorem, but a different approach, a topological approach. You can show the same thing. The same thing is that the helicity is zero and the sum of linking numbers is zero. Aha, uh -huh. the sum of linking number is zero, assuming that all the defects have equal charge, for example, one or two pi, etc. So can we apply this uh, to a tangle of filaments? And we did. Dewitt Sumner gave uh, a topological proof of this statement. And not only the total helicity is zero, but the single helicity for each element is zero. That means that we can associate a linking matrix to this, like this, and we have on the diagonal the linking of a defect with itself, so the self-linking, and the other is the linking of one defect with another, and so on. This matrix is real and symmetric. It can be diagonalized, blah, blah, blah. And this statement here says that the sum of all these contributions, or the sum of any of the horizontal contributions, are zero. Okay, so we have a consequence of this. A consequence of this will come later. Now I move quickly to show you the idea of a topological cascade, and then I go to this, to this idea of zero helicity. Topological cascade, this is a famous experiment done by Irvine uh, uh, Group in Chicago, and this is uh, the production of a trifoil knotted uh, vortex filament in water. And then they observe the decay of this. And this is the representation of the same structure. And as we do this, we see that uh, there is a reconnection somewhere. And it goes from a trifle to the so-called Hopf link. Then there is another reconnection, two strands reconnecting together. And we have the production of a long convoluted uh, loop. And then a farther reconnection with the displacement of this and the production of these two separated loops. 
So this is the kind of cascade I have in mind for you. And I call it a topological cascade because there is, of course, continuous deformation. So geometry keeps changing, but there is a jump in topology. All the time there is a reconnection. Okay, so the same was done long time ago by Simone Zuckers with his code. And we have a cascade of a hop link at this stage to a convoluted loop at this stage, a production of distinct uh, loops uh, were there. And we could follow simulation with the production of other loops, etc., etc. So this is uh, just uh, briefly recall the paper of 2017, very quickly hop link. This is just uh, uh, certifying, so to speak, that uh, helicity stays zero through reconnection as well with a little jump, of course. And uh, then I'd be very quick, the rise goes down and the twist goes up because the sum is the self-linking number that is the only thing that survives and this uh, stays to zero. Uh, these are various stages. I won't bother you with all this information. And then we went on to consider the simulation of uh, standard known uh, dynamics from classical uh, from classical fluid mechanics. This is the um, head-on collision of uh, defect rings that was done initially by uh, Lim and others uh, uh, in the 90s. We reproduce that, and so you see that there is a, an interaction, the two rings are one against the other, opposite uh, vorticity, and then at a certain point they form a diadem of uh, little rings. Uh, again, the same thing for complicated knots. Here is a, an example of the torus knot Q9, and at a certain point uh, the reconnection production of one big loop, and then a cascade towards the smaller loops, etc. This topological cascade, this cascade in terms of topology, is consistent with all. We did many more simulations. If you go to the paper, you see the movie as well. I cannot play this movie, but more or less is that. Uh, Rife is conserved under anti-parallel reconnection. This is a resu rigorous result by laying a towel uh, of uh, 2015. So we go back uh, to the case of GPE, helicity equals zero. But Rife remains conserved across reconnection. So we did with Simone Zucker, we were interested, I was interested in uh, having information uh, something that is remote, probably for your own interest, especially physicists. I was interested to the energy associated to the surface, to the surface bounded by the defect. So imagine a ring, the surface would be a disk. And of course, you can think of the disk, uh, many, many surfaces bounded by this, by this ring. You look for the minimal area, like plateau problem. And if you look for minimal area, is a planar disk for the planar circle. So we did that on all these configurations. So imagine the torus knots family, the links, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the most simple ones. And uh, from this uh, information, we can conclude that anti-parallel reconnection preserves orientation of minimal area Zypher surface. Zypher surfaces are these surfaces of minimal of uh, of uh, or oriented surface, not not necessarily of minimal area. So we have a situation like this. Imagine in space two rings that are colliding uh, somehow in a in an oblique direction, and then we have a collision, interaction, reconnection, anti-parallel reconnection, and separation. This is standard, and uh, you can see it in many movies. Uh, when you think of the surface, this is the idea. The surface remains oriented under uh, reconnection. And this is good news for some physical considerations. The other one is the topological instability. Imagine, remember, we are still uh, in the context of zero helicity under GPE. So zero helicity means total sum of linking numbers zero. Now, suppose that you take uh, one defect and you superimpose artificially, if you like, a twist. You twist around the isophase surfaces. So that means the twist, uh, you induce twist, twist is no longer zero. 
but the sum with right has to be zero. So what happens? So we can prove uh, with Matteo Foresti that uh, if uh, uh, these uh, uh, relation is satisfied and the Laplacian of the twist is greater than zero, then the defect is unstable with diffusion of twist. Oh, that's interesting. It's unstable with diffusion of twist. So what happens? Because twist and right had to be set to zero. And so this is uh, what happens. We have the production of new defects. So we start uh, with a single defect, for example, Assume that at a certain point we induce twist, so the self-linking is different from zero, then it cannot stay like that because it contradicts the zero helicity condition. So it has to be produced a new defect and uh, suppose this is the initial condition, right zero, and some twist superimposed self-linking number is not zero, is one. So this is the initial condition as you uh, as you run the code immediately, instantly, a new defect is produced because the linking between the central defect and the ring gives you self-linking zero. So the matrix information has to be of this type and that is what you get. So I conclude with this. Uh, yes, uh, it was a joke in uh, in Venice, but I think this topological condition is very interesting for the production of defects. For example, from a defect to go towards a tangle of defects, turbulent, et cetera, et cetera, conditions. I will uh, stop here and I thank you very much for your attention.